All right, all, welcome to um, Chemistry Lab, and uh, today I'm just going to be continuing with some of the stuff that we had gone over in um, some of the lectures that we had in, in practice. So let's just continue with, you know, first just classifying matter and creating a better understanding of, like, what exactly we're learning about. So chemistry, everything that you're going to learn about in chemistry has a simple notion that everything is made of matter. Okay, that's a really, really thick color, so I'm actually just gonna change that real quick. And that, so if we have matter, we can, basically what this means is anything that takes up space. And also has mass. But we can further classify matter we can further classify matter into two things, a mixture or a pure substance. And we'll t I'm sure you might have heard this already in some of your um, you know, physical sciences or chemistry classes, but pure substances are basically substances that are not combined with other you know, elements or something. So for example, if I want to have a pure substance, it could either be in the form of an element, which is something that, you know, you, you'll have the same element in a pure substance, or it'll be made out of compounds. And in this case, uh, the, a compound is defined as two or more uh, elements that are chemically bonded. And in a pure substance, say a pure substance of compounds, you would have the same compound just um, in multiple uh, quantities. Now let's move on to the mixture part. So the mixture um, has two terms as well. You could be homogeneous or heterogeneous. And what I want you to take out of this are these prefixes. Homo means same, while hetero means different. So learning about just these two prefixes will get you a really long way in biology and um, chemistry. Basically, homo homologous or homogeneous, see I just mixed up a biology term that starts with homo. Um, it's the same solution throughout, which means that there's equal proportions. So we have equal proportions. You won't see, okay, say I had a glass of water. You're not going to see me having more, wa less water up here. And then more water like that over here. It's equally distributed. Right? It'll be equally distributed amongst all of the places. Heterogeneous, on the other hand, is you can visibly see different parts of your substance or your mixture. So say I had a jar and it was mixed with, you know, metal and pebbles. So say the metal is silver, silver colored. Um, what is, what was like? Something like this. We have metal. So yeah, say this is silver and then we had, I don't know, chunks of gold or something. Which would be yellow. So this would be a heterogeneous mixture because you can clearly see the difference between the two. So that's just an introduction to um, you know classification of matter. We can further classify matter itself into, for right now, we'll just keep it at three different states. So matter is made of three different states. I'm going to try to color code this as well. Matter. And, I mean, this is something we all have learned in, like, third grade, right? We have solids, liquids, and gases. And, you know, there's a reason that we say solids, liquids, and gases in that order. Or what we say liquids, or sorry, gases, liquids, and solids. We don't ever say liquids, gases, or solids. We say, we can't ever say liquids, solids, and gases. We say, we keep it in an order. And I'll tell you what this exactly means. But as a precursor, when we're saying it in a certain order, it means that um, we're judging or we're assessing the amount of uh, kinetic energy in that um, 
state of matter. So we go solid, liquid, gas, where solid has the least amount of kinetic energy, uh, liquids have a medium amount of kinetic energy, and lastly, gases have the most amount of kinetic energy out of all three of those um, states of matter. And these are joined together through something known as the kinetic molecular theory. Kinetic molecular theory. And what this theory states is basically the state of matter of a substance can be determined by the activity or excitement of the particles that make it up. So for example, let's say I have, um, I don't know, a solid metal cube. Uh, let's make it this color. It's a metal cube and say it's made of silver ions, Ag+. So what's happening here is and I'm color coding it red because Ag plus is obviously a cation. What's happening here is there's so little space between each of the silver ions that there's essentially close to no movement. So this is like here. We would have it would be jam packed. Like it would essentially. I'm sure you've heard of something called a lattice. It basically forms a structure that acts as a solid. Although there is space between um, each of the atoms and like there's vibration of all of these and there is some amount of kinetic energy, it's not suffice to change its volume. So that's what when we define a solid, we say it has a definite volume. On the other hand, we have liquids. So liquids, for example, water are made of H2O molecules. So I mean, for for ease sake, I'm just going to make them all blue. We have more spacing between them. And if there's more spacing between each of the molecules, that means they can move around and they can have more interactions. Um, so there's more kinetic energy in liquids than there are in solids. Finally, gas. You can't really define a gas, can you? It does not have a definite volume. Neither does a liquid because obviously it's, it's a changing shape. But you what we usually see when we're trying to characterize gases i'm going to keep it white because i mean it's kind of you know the the elemental state of everything you'll have gases gas particles moving in all different directions and there's no confined volume to it unless you like put it in a container whereas i guess you can have it contain volume but there's so much movement that it's moving I guess you could say it's moving so fast that you visibly can't even see the, the gas. Like, you can't see the air that we're touching, can you? So, in that way, it's just moving. It has a lot of kinetic energy, and thus it's moving really fast. So, if we were to rate this per kinetic energy, let's see. We would say solid has the least amount of kinetic energy, and gases has the most. All right? So, that is... The three states of matter summarized. Obviously, there are more states of matter. Bose-Einstein cond condensate, condensed matter, um, plas plasma, and there are actually a few more as well. But th that's behind the scope of uh, Science Olympiad Chemistry Lab, so we're not going to go through that. Finally, to talk about um, you know actual quantitative chemistry, we need to define some laws. So, for example, I'm sure all of you have heard of the law law of I'm just gonna put law of here because we're gonna have a lot of laws so we have conservation of mass basically what conservation of mass means is that mass cannot be and you might have guessed it created or destroyed So what this exactly means in, in the confines of chemistry is that if I'm having a reaction, the mass of the products or the mass of the reactants should equal the mass of the products. And that's just something that we abide to. And that's how stoichiometry works. We have to take certain proportions and we had to translate it so that mass is still equal. So uh, the next law we're going to talk about is constant composition. And I'll change the color for this. constant composition so constant composition composition says that 
a given compound will always be in the same proportion of elements by mass, which is also kind of ties into what an imperial formula is. So basically what this says is compound element proportion is constant. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So for example, if I have water, H2O, that means that for one water molecule, I will always have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And their masses would be in that same ratio as well. If one hydrogen atom is um, 1.008, um, a like 1.008 grams, then two of them is going to be 2.016. And one atom of oxygen is going to be 16. So that 2.016 to 16 ratio is always going to be there. Okay, and that's how we determine empirical formula as well. But we're not really going to go into that because, I mean, I'm sure everybody has learned about empirical formula. There's also a law of multiple proportions, but in the span of a chemistry lab experiment, we're not going to really need to cover that, so we're not going to do it. So I've talked about molecules and compounds, and I think it's high time that I actually define the difference between them. So molecules are, so molecules, I'll put this in blue. Molecules are multiple atoms that are covalently bonded. Right, and they're electrically, molecules have to be electrically neutral, which means they're essentially nonpolar. So, for example, water is not a polar substance, but it's considered a molecule, which basically, what I mean by electrically neutral, I guess, is, uh, let, let's just, let's just keep this over here. This doesn't necessarily hold. What I mean by electrically neutral is that the number of protons equals the number of electrons. Well, obviously you might think, okay, if I have, say I have three, three positive charges and I have three negative charges, these cancel out one by one, two and three, and we have zero charge. So, however, polyatomic ions, which are another type of, you know, substance uh, containing, you know, compound-like structure. Um, let's make this polyatomic ions. Are basically ions or multiple atoms that are covalently bonded, but they're not electri electrically neutral. And basically, this is something that you should probably put on your note sheet because uh, there are there's a list and you don't want to memorize it. But some common ones you might have heard of are like nitrate NO3 minus or OH minus. Essentially, this plus this minus or this charge on these ions is or on these compounds is what makes it um, like an, a polyatomic ion. So. And then obviously compound is basically the, the combination of atoms of different elements. Um, that's pretty much all I have for you today. Um, nomenclature is a big thing that you may have to cover on your own because, I mean, to be honest, nomenclature is really easy. Um, I, when you're dealing with ionic substances, all you do is combine the two names and you're done. You have to change the, the nonpolar thing, or sorry, the non the non-metal thing from an ene or whatever it might be to an ide, which is pretty easy to do. And for, uh, say, covalently bonded things, you just have to say I had H2O3, it would be dihydrogen trioxide. So you just have to use the ratio of atoms that you have and make that your um, prefix, which is simple enough. So that's enough for this video. Uh, I'll stop rambling now. And yeah.